uh, Hosh released training back in the very early 90s. You know, back in the late 80s, early 90s, Mount Hosh released had a pretty um, disreputable reputation amongst the physical therapy community. And, um, you know, my physical therapy publications were doing a pretty regular article, regular articles, kind of bashing Mount Hosh release, and I bought into that. So um, it took a, a co-worker of mine who just about twisted my arm and finally got me to take my first seminar. And, you know, from the first seminar on, I was hooked. And uh, it was pretty interesting because from the first day that I came back from that seminar, I was able to do some things with my hands that I really never had been able to do before. And I just, I, I ate it up. I took as many classes as I could. I could and um, after a couple of years, I started traveling around the country teaching and assisting another therapist teaching uh, the mouthwash release. And um, just kept taking more classes and integrating into my, my own private practice. And, oh, about uh, seven years now, I started my own line of seminars, Foundations and Mouthwash Release Seminars, which started really quite small and slowly and, you know, rolling a little bit. It's uh, classes are getting bigger, a little bit more frequent, traveling around the country, meeting a lot of great people, massage therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and uh, I'm really enjoying myself. And I've got a practice in Rochester, New York, where I see um, chronic and acute pain primarily, and 100% mouthwash release. I do physical therapy from a very different aspect than other physical therapists. It's not the exercise base. It's not the weakness model causing pain. It's more tightness. Let's take care of the tightness, and often the pain takes care of itself. If it needs strengthening, I send them on to somebody else. But so often, it's not the strength that's, a, that's the issue. It's the tightness within the body. And um, is it hard to sell on myofascial release then? You mean to my consumer patients? Yeah. Um, no, um, not for me at least. That's all my practice. Um, that's all I do in my practice. So I've got a really wide referral base from physicians to acupuncturists and chiropractors. You name it. I've got a real wide base of, of support there. And, you know, word of mouth is by far anybody's best referral service. Most people really don't care what I do. You know, I used to spend a lot of time trying to educate the public and educate doctors, you know, that myofascial release was the best thing since sliced bread, you know, but they didn't really care. You know, they were sending people because they were getting better and patients didn't care. They were getting better. They really didn't care what I did. So probably about five years ago, six years ago, I switched my marketing strategy, strategy from selling myofascial release to selling pain relief. And I haven't changed the name of my business to the pain relief center. I mean, it's, it's perfectly clear what I do and what I try to accomplish. And so no, it's, to me, it's a pretty easy sell. And is there diff many different um, types of MFR then? Absolutely. Myofascial release, you might say it's a small n, small r, because there's no real trademark or copyright or anything on the words myofascial release. So, you know, as a result, you can get everything from of oh, deep, aggressive, soft tissue mobilization, deep tissue massage, it's called myofascial release. Roll thing is truly um, a version of myofascial release. There's gentler versions of myofascial release, which is the type I practice, and trigger point therapy can also be considered myofascial release. So it's pretty confusing for the consumer. A lot of times people call around and they might be asking for myofascial release because they had it before somewhere else. They come in and they're just really puzzled. They say, this isn't what I got before. And, yeah, it does create some confusing, confusion amongst the public, but typically once they're on the table and they get an opportunity to feel what's happening, they get it pretty quickly. And do you incorporate a lot of um, stretching of the limbs, too, with it? Absolutely. You know, um, myofascial release is, uh, yeah, it's a pretty broad term for a lot of different styles of work, from you know, very focused cross-handed release, which is a real traditional way of doing it, the, um, hands on the body to um, traction releases through the arm and the leg, which would be considered more traditional or more like traditional stretching. I incorporate a lot of myofascial self stretching, which more resembles traditional stretching, but huge difference between what somebody might do as a pre or post sort of workout and what I teach my patients. You know, typical pre or post stretch for exercise might be a 30 to 60 second stretch at a fairly high level of intensity. Um, I prefer from a low load and long duration type of stretch. Essentially, um, we're going only to the first general barrier of tightness is felt. 
And I'm going to ask that my patient to hold that for a minimum of five minutes, and often quite uh, quite a bit longer. And you know, it's uh, it's it's an interesting learning curve for a lot of people, especially people who are into um, athletics and things, where it's that aggressive pain they want to feel when they stretch. And I try and get into their heads that that's not the most beneficial way to stretch. Um, research is all over the place, you know, when it comes to stretching. But some of the newer stretching. Um, Things that are, or, I'm sorry, the research is coming out of kind of supports what, what we're talking about here, low, low, long duration stretching. And um, for that, I mean, so many people, it seems they want the deeper version, but you can still affect everything with the lighter version? Absolutely. You know, I, I do get some people coming in not knowing what to expect, and they, you know, they tell me, well, you know, I have, I have a lot of body work, I have a lot of massage, whatever that is, and, you know, they'll tell me I like it really deep. Um, and they're coming to me not, hopefully not for just, they're not coming to me for relaxation. It's not the type of work I do. Um, they're coming to me to deal with some sort of pain condition. And, um, you know, when they, when they say that, I really like it. I always get really deep. I like it when you can't hurt me, that sort of thing. Without sounding too sarcastic, which I have trouble doing at times, um, I'll sort of say, well, how's that working for you, right? Um, if, if that deep work is what you need and why, how's it working? And if it's not working, we should be willing to, to step back and try something else. And, you know, in my experience, I've never gotten anybody to get off the table and leave because I'm too gentle, okay? Um, you know, they might still go back to another person and find, find somebody who does that more aggressive work because they think it helps, and I can't say that it doesn't. Everything helps somebody to some degree. I just have some different things to offer people, and I've had some pretty good success. And do you ever use any kind of lubrication with it? Oh, no, never, never. Um, uh, my posture release, the way I practice, teach my posture release is a dry modality. You know, for the first 16 years I practiced my, my posture release, was always dry hands, right? When a new client comes in, they're set, or they download a history form and, and some instructions from my website, right? They fill the history form in. Here's the instructions. I want you to bring this change of clothing to come in. And then I want you to wear no lotion or oil. Because any kind of lotion or oil on the body is really going to interfere with my ability to really get some contact with that. Um, lotion or oil used to require me, <coughs> excuse me, to push deeper, a little harder, just to get that contact. Um, but then, oh, probably about four years ago, somebody introduced me to a chalk ball. Now it's climbers chalk, right? Um, what great! You pop it on your hands, and just like climbers when they're rock climbing, they don't want to slip. Well, this stuff will work fantastic. And I started using climbing chalk for about a year and a half or two years. Worked outstanding. It gave my hands the ability to stick like I never really you know, was able to do before. Big downside, though, um, it was the dust that was created in my office. And you know, I kind of hit a critical mass every couple of months where you just have to just air, air out the whole place because everything was dust covered. And then I do a, um, a myofascial mentoring program at my clinic where I'll have th uh, therapists uh, actually from around the world. We've got some therapists recently, one from Singapore, one from Ireland who's come over to do some training. Most of them are from the United States, though. But I had an occupational therapist from Ohio come in, and she spent a week with me, and we did a lot of hands-on work, hand, you know, learning some technique, learning the feel, um, and showed her the chalk ball. And, you know, everybody I showed the chalk ball just in love with it as much as I am. So she went back to her clinic hospital-based clinic type um, setting, and was told that she couldn't use it because it didn't pass Medicare rights. So she found um, a liquid chalk, liquid, liquid chalk, two different brands out in the market. And it's an alcohol-based product. Squirt a little bit on my hands, rub it in, um, makes your hands white, but you can stick through anything. <laughs> well, that's cool. Well, I'm, that's yeah. lines, you know, um, I'm, I'm probably getting heavy by it, but uh, I, I'm moving things into more of a neurological based model and just took an outstanding seminar um, oh, probably three or four weeks ago from Diane Jacobs, a Canadian physiotherapist who um, has a technique called dermo neuromodulation called DNM. Um, Diane uses Dyson. Now Dyson, for those who don't know what it is, is it's a product that a lot of occupational therapists in hospital settings use to keep things from sliding. And basically, it, it, you could not understand it, it provides incredible friction. So that you can be so light and so sensitive and do a lot of different things with that um, Dyson that I've never been able to, I've never done in the past in my fresh release. Now, Dyson sells for about $200 a roll. Um, what performs about 90% as well is good old fashioned non skid pad. 
Um, not this tiny put on your kitchen under or your kitchen uh, <laughs> covers to keep things yeah. from sliding, dishes, etc. And buy a little Walmart or Target for eight bucks works just as well. I'm would, running, would corn would corn starch work too or? No, um, I, I don't think so. I think that's got too much of a slippery quality. Okay, and yeah. um, have you had any problems with breakouts at all with that? I'm not. No. Okay. So no, no. well, that's a good thing. So yeah. you know. <laughs> And then um, with with the myofascial release too. I mean, do you always call it myofascial release, or um, what's your style then? Well, um, yeah, I call what I do myofascial release for the last twenty years. Um, I'm I, so as I said before, I'm beginning to move my um, my way of thinking, my exploration into the the neurology neuroscience versus the fascia based model. Okay. Um, there's some people who feel that, well, I'm kind of a hypocrite calling what I'm doing myofascial release. If I don't necessarily believe it's the fascia that's doing all or any of the action here. And um, I get it. Um, I get where they're coming from. But, you know, there's a certain name recognition value to myofascial release that I'm not quite ready to give up yet. And uh, we'll see where it takes. This will probably be a couple of year process for me. But right now I'm really in, uh, enjoying the process of just... You're kind of crossing over a bridge and, and exploring some new territory. And for the whole nervous system, I mean, has that, that been researched much or um, investigated um, related to myofascial release then? Um, well, um, from, some, from a couple perspectives, it has. I mean, a lot of the research that's come out of the Fascia Congress and some of the ancillary research related to that, uh, folks like Robert Schleff, who's a, um, a German researcher and role for, you know, Robert and a lot of other really smart folks have done some great research and great papers and books um, on the, the, what exactly is happening with fashion. And um, finding some of the neuroreceptors, mechanoreceptors, et cetera, embedded within the fascia that seem to be responsible for some of the changes that are occurring. You know, um, I had an email correspondence with Robert about, about three or four years ago when this whole thing with the emerging neuroscience and the fascial research was coming out, and I, and I asked him in his opinion where he thought that balance point would be between um, the old-fashioned mechanical change, right, the, the elastin, the collagen, the ground substance, all that stuff that the osteopaths have taught for the last, uh, you know, 70, 80 years, and a lot of people are still teaching, and this other end of, of neuroscience. And I asked where the, where the pendulum would find the land, and he thought it would be more 70% neuro and... 20, or I'm sorry, 30% mechanical. So, you know, even here's, here's a, a fascial researcher who saw that, you know, the future was really in the neurology. And, um, you know, that's that's kind of what that got me started, both uh, in terms of exploration myself and in terms of some additional training that I've taken. I think one big difference that, um, you know, I'm certainly not inventing anything here. I'm just exploring things from a different avenue. And what I'm exploring differently, I believe, is... Um, the fascia research is looking at fascia's role, the, ne the neurology of fascia, how that influences change. What I'm doing is crossing over that bridge and saying, well, let's see what's before the fascia, right? Is the nervous system responsible? Can it be doing some of these changes without even having to affect or bring in fascia, bring in muscle, bring in anything? Um, can those changes be explained solely um, from the, the nervous system? And that's where uh, sort of find some interesting information, and frankly, having a lot of fun. And has there been a um, uh, where do you see going um, this route then? Um, well, um, hopefully, to make me some more complete or at least alternative models of explanation. I think um, it's a little presumptuous to me to say that it's a more complete because. You know, I, I, I think it says it's better than, and I don't mean that it's better than. You know, there's certainly holes in every theory. There's holes in every bit of research you can find. And, um, <clears throat> well, the, the, the folks that I've met along the path where neuroscience, neurology, the, the nervous system is their way of explaining everything, you know, I still see some, some weak points in there. Um, there's certainly a lot of weak points in the fascial explanation, both the old, especially the older, but some of the newer ones as well. So, uh, where do I see this going? Um, hopefully, uh, toward a better explanation, I think what's even more important is we're more effective, right? Um, I hear so many people, you know, I'm on so many 
internet groups, Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, all oh, my newsletter, that sort of thing. And one of the common complaints, if you will, is the therapists, you know, massage therapists, physical therapists, et cetera, et cetera, they're not complaining that, you know, I don't really care about research. It's, it's results that matter. Right? Some of my clients are getting better. The research doesn't matter. And I used to be in that boat, too, because the way I used to practice, the way I was taught, there wasn't a lot of research to back it up. Um, you know, and I, I bought into that, really, and I, I, I mouth those words a lot of times. But now I'm seeing, with, especially with some of the training and education that I've been given recently, that it really can make you more effective. For instance, if, you know, what's big in my seminar, or I really am big on, is teaching the field. Right? And I think it's a really missing piece for a lot of people, is to really be able to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with each and every therapist in a class and teach them what, and I used to say fascial restriction feels like, okay? When you reach in slowly and you look around with a lot of patients and just look around and feel and say, oh yeah, what is that? There's a hard point, right? There's a, something ropey or solid. Let me just, let me just think, engage that barrier. And then I get the feedback from my client. And that's, that's the, the cycle of learning in my seminar. Well, what if there's a way to engage the nervous system a little bit more? And as I said, I took a, a seminar recently from Diane Jacobs, and she works solely from a peripheral nerve perspective as well as the skin, um, the skin nerve perspective. And you know, if you take a look at where some of the deeper nerves come to the surface, access the nerves at that point, you can affect the whole path of that nerve. And that kind of really blew a hole in, in what I thought I was doing. And again, you know, it doesn't have to be right or wrong. It's just an incredibly deep way, different way of looking at things. And to me, um, it made a lot of sense. And then with, um, do you also, let's say somebody comes in with, um, let's say, lower back pain, do, mm -hmm. you, um, do you have a certain protocol for certain ailments and problems then? Or do you focus more on the specific areas then? You know, um, from the first day that I started my malpractice training, I was taught, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful way to look at the body, is don't ever get locked into protocols, okay? Don't ever do cookbook therapy. Um, when you do cookbook ther therapy, I believe you miss a lot of things. Yes, there are always things that you may want to do your mental or actual physical checklist, but I want to make sure I check this. But what I try and do when a, when a patient comes in to me as a new patient, um, I try and look at them completely fresh, and I do a full full body evaluation. I do a standing, sitting, sitting, supine and prone evaluation because I want to take a look, I want to touch, I want to evaluate their whole body. In my experience, the pain isn't always where the, um, the problem isn't always where the pain is felt. You really need to evaluate the whole body. Um, you know, I think one of the things that surprises patients the most, and you pick low back as an example, and it's a perfect example, is um, my session length is 50 minutes long, okay? Um, a new evaluation, <clears throat> I might spend half of that time doing the evaluation, so between 20 and 30 minutes of that time, we have for actual hands-on treatment. They're coming in for back pain. I may never flip them over on their stomach to work on the back. I may spend the entire time working deep in the front of their stomach, right? Working the area of the hip flexors, working the area of scar abdominal scar tissue. Um, <clears throat> That's really the way I treat them. I treat probably 70, 80% of back pain from deep in the front of the spine. Yes, I might be engaging the sacrum and then the sacrum doing some tractioning, engaging some of the soft tissue and nervous system, but I spend most of the time working on their front. And, uh, you know, some people have given me some strange looks as I'm spending the whole time working deep in the spine, deep in the abdomen, and that sort of thing. When they get off the table and they're feeling the change, I don't have to do much um, convincing why I'm working where I'm working because the feeling changes. Yeah, for myself too. I mean, that's the only thing that takes care of my low back pains and stuff is when people work my abdominals. I mean, it's and so as and everything else. It's just yeah. amazing. Another strong thing about um, my form of myofascial release that I practice as well as teach is a long time ago, I, I, I saw that people were really able to feel some, some lasting positive changes in a real short period of time. So um, earlier on in my print materials, but then um, now on my website, I make a promise to people, and I, I make a promise that I think I can keep that within three sessions at the most, they're going to feel lasting positive changes. 
And I tell them that some people are done by three sessions, some people are just scratching the surface, but pretty much just about everybody feels some sort of a lasting positive change within those three sessions, or I'm not going to try and convince them to do more. And that's a really powerful promise, and it's one we talk about a lot at our seminars, because, you know, I, I, I know before I started doing the work I'm doing here, I could never even think of being able to make a promise like that, because I didn't have... I didn't have the knowledge available to do those things. I didn't have the skills in my hands to do those things. So that's been, I don't want to call it a sales pitch because it's a lot more than that. It's really my how my results show up. And then a question in the chat, um, chat, do you find that clients are confused about that? Do you explain first, during, or after? Could you repeat the question? Um, do you find that the clients are confused about that? Um, do you explain first, during, or after? About what? I'm sorry. I, it might be about the domino. Oh, the, why are we yeah. your abdominals? Yeah. No, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, I've got to scale up my office if we need to uh, explain. If I want to go, you know, again, I'm in transition. I used to always explain exactly where the cellus was and how the cellus had stuck and pull the pelvis forward, um, create an increased lumbar lordosis, working from that structural model, um, which now, um, even on my blog, I'm kind of blowing holes in that structural model. But we talk about why that can be important. But again, um, it's less what I say than what we touch, right? So if I can go put some gentle pressure into their abdominal region, and I really am going through their abdominal muscles. We're going into some deeper structures, not forceful in any way. But if I can go in there and recreate their pain, recreate their back pain, um, I don't have to do much education at all. They just figured it out. Aha, that aha moment, right? You reach in here, they feel their back pain, they get it right away. And do you get into muscle testing and also posture evaluations? Um, I, okay, um, physical therapist um, in New York, I'm, let me back up. I'm a physical therapist in New York State. I'm an outer network physical therapist, which means I don't take people's insurance, but they can, res or they can submit my bills for reimbursement if their insurance plan allows them to. So um, as a result, I have to be um, measuring and testing some pretty objective measurements during my evaluation as well as documenting along the way so that your insurance company feels it's a valid reason to be seeing this person. So yes, I do, um, if, if need be, I do manual muscle testing, I do range of motion assessment, I do postural assessment, I do um, orthopedic tests. You know, there's, there's a lot of different um, objective tests available for us out there, and I think the more of those we know, the better we have of either getting reimbursed or allowing our patients to be care reimbursed. And the postural model um, is another one that is really, for me, being called into question. Um, I, uh, if, you, if you're not already aware, I have a blog on my website. My website is foundationsandmfr.com. <clears throat> I have a blog that's attached to it. And, you know, on the blog, I, over the last couple of months, I've been really uh, pushing some boundaries a bit and, um, you know, maybe feeling my own a little bit with seeing some of the changes in what I've been learning in terms of the results and exploring some of the things that some other people are saying out there. Um, let me give you, for instance, Paul Ingraham. He's, uh, he's a Canadian um, massage therapist who's no longer practicing. He's uh, actually a journalist now. And um, I think a lot of people who are watching tonight or may watch this uh, show probably know of Paul's writings, and they may not like Paul's writings, and I think, uh, I think that's understandable. Paul has written some pretty negative um, blog posts on malfascia release and the importance of fascia and, uh, you know, fascia is king, and trying, really trying to uh, deconstruct some of those, uh, uh, some, some of the myths surrounding this, okay? Now, I, I tuned into Paul's blog about uh, two or three years ago, and I thought he was an idiot. You know, uh, because he wasn't saying what I wanted to read. He was saying things that really challenged what I believed and what I was practicing and what I was teaching. Um, Paul and I have become friends now, at least I'm like friends, and uh, I see a lot of merit to some of the things he has to say. I think we all need to be able to stand up and really take a good look at ourselves, what we're saying, what we're doing, what we're doing with our hands, what we're speaking to our clients, and what we're thinking, right? Yep. I one of my mantras now is don't change what you're doing, change what you think. Okay, what we're doing under our hands has great effect. Okay, but it's what's going on with our mind that really is where we can grow. And then once we grow our mind, then maybe our hands can grow too. 
And then another chat question on uh, Swade. Um, do you find that MFR can be combined effectively with other techniques, or do you find that it stands best alone? Well, um, I, ha I can only speak for myself. Um, I, uh, okay, I could never say I have 100% of my actual practice. I have done a fair amount of training, training psychotherapy, zero balancing, some of the newer neurological work. But then before my fascia was training, I, I did so much continuing education, a wide variety of orthopedic and pediatric developmental disability type things where it's impossible to say, I don't do anything else. But, um, you know, I do not combine things um, such as massage, such as um, exercise-based physical therapy. I don't personally find the need in my practice. I know a lot of therapists who are doing myofascial release along with, say, for instance, Pilates, right? Could be a good combination. I, I teach a lot of massage therapists who are trying to figure out, okay, how can I integrate this new work with my existing work? And we talk about that a lot in, uh, in the seminars because you know what? You're going to have clients coming in who they've been with you for a while. They may, they may understand that you're excited about this new work that can really do some nice things, but they like you for what you've been doing. So they're kind of tough to convert. Some people you can, some people you can't. Maybe it's the new people you want to try and convert, right? You don't have to convert anybody, really. You start practicing this, doing this on some clients, and they're going to be convinced pretty quickly. But if you're going to combine this with uh, some more traditional massage modalities, pick the first part of the session to do the dry work, not fast release, right? Um, after you're done with that, move into the to the to the wet modalities. They can work really well together. And I know a lot of people, massage therapists in particular, who built very successful practices combining all of those modalities that they use, right? Including mouthwash release. You know, the toolbox um, analogy is not a bad one. Um, you know, a lot of therapists have a big, wide toolbox with a lot of different modalities, a lot of different tools in there. I like to think of my toolbox as pretty shallow, but hopefully, without being presumptuous, pretty deep, okay? Um, a lot of background, a lot of experience, and hopefully a lot of depth of understanding deepens my toolbox a little bit more. And another, another question in the chat, is there a typical explanation that you um, use to explain myofascial release to clients, like an elevator speech or anything else? To... Um, yeah, yeah, the elevator speech, there's a good one, you know. Um, yeah. Um, I always stumble with my elevator speech um, until the last couple of years, and then um, up to about six months ago, I had a darn good elevator speech. Now um, it's 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 not quite as good because of some of the new directions I'm going. Okay, um, if I've got a thirty second elevator speech, I may never mention my pressure list. Okay, if I'm coming in contact with a potential client or a potential referee. I may never mention the words not fast release because um, their eyes start to glaze over immediately. The, the, my, my talking points are pain relief and manual therapy. I want them to, number one, know that what I do is extremely effective for pain relief. I deal with other piece, people's basket cases, the people they've not been in now, the ones with the medicine, the, medica or the medication, the surgeries, the other therapies, the chiropractic, the act, everything, where the other things haven't worked, okay? Um, so my elevator speech consists of telling them that I'm really good pain relief, and I'm not a traditional physical therapist. I don't use exercise. I don't have the gym flow equipment. I don't have a stem machine, ultrasound. I use my hands. It's more of a manual therapy. So um, you know that's basic in my 30-second elevator speech. If I'm given the opportunity to talk a little bit longer, I'll definitely get into myofascial myofascial release a bit, but again, I don't try and get too heavily into trying to um, educate somebody that, at that level or converting anybody. It's more of a results-driven therapy. Um, I, I send them to places if they want to read it. Yeah, we'll talk about it while we're doing some work, but um, that's certainly not how I'm going to spend the first 30 precious seconds with a uh, potential client. Okay, and then um, do you usually incorporate, um, do you actually take pictures of people's posture too at all? Um, not anymore. <clears throat> when I first started in private practice oh, about um, 13 years ago, I took a lot of um, postural pictures from front, side, and back. I put them on a grid, and you know, we do a lot of music for a teaching purpose, right? Um, well, here your shoulders low, this hips high, this sort of thing. Um, in theory, it was good to send doctors, good to send insurance companies, right? Um, people like seeing the changes over time. But the more I, I became to understand some of the, the limitations of following a postural approach, 
the less and less I use that. Okay. Let me give you, for instance, um, I may get a patient coming in who's got an extremely depressed shoulder, okay? Pain in this area, right? Well, you know, um, from a postural model, I want to try and raise this shoulder and bring this shoulder down. Makes perfect sense, right? You want to bring them back to symmetry. And you get somebody in pain, it makes perfect sense to them because, well, I'm an educated person. I'm telling them that's how this works. And, you know, people can, um, and I don't mean this in a, in a bad way, but can be pretty gullible. They want to believe you because they want to believe that you can help, right? Um, but what about that person out on the street with wildly asymmetrical shoulders who doesn't have pain? How do you explain that? How do you put this all in um, a frame of reference to have it all make sense? And that's where the postural model often fails. Now, I still teach postural evaluation. I still do some postural evaluation because I believe it has some value. But I certainly don't base my treatment um, decisions solely on posture or solely on structure. You know, orthopedic tests can be really powerful and give you some important information, but you know, they, they're not the whole picture. So I certainly would never want to uh, base a treatment plan only on someone's posture. And then what is a typical cost for a treatment then? Cost? Yeah. Well, um, I, that, that really varies widely region by region. Um, you know, it depends um, who the practitioner is. Um, you know, massage therapists can charge different rates than physical therapists and occupational therapists and, you know, some of the other um, licensed professionals do this work. I secured everything from, you know, the, the traditional massage therapy rates. And, and I know in some parts of the country it's as low as maybe, you know, for a private practice, 30 to $40 for a 50 to 60 minute session to, well, you can, you can go to the extreme other end of the scale to some large city therapists We've got successful practices. We're bringing in a couple hundred dollars for an hour of, of private pay work. And, you know, I, I certainly encourage anybody to be testing the water a little bit there and, and get paid what they're worth. But, um, you know, ultimately, we want to try and provide a value for people. We want to try and help people get better and charge what's there. I do, I do think that having a special skill um, merits raising your rates a little bit. Now, there's a lot of special skills. Being extremely good at pain relief, that's a special skill that a lot of people are willing to uh, pay a little bit or a lot more. Okay, so it's something to think about for people. Um, what's funny is when I'm teaching seminars, invariably when, I say, when we start having this conversation in class, I get somebody who just starts shaking their head and say, oh, you, you just don't know my clientele. You know, the <clears throat> unemployment's high, we would call it, you know, that sort of thing. It's, you know, um, I'm, I live in Rochester, New York. You know, we're in the recession just like everybody else. But ultimately, if you're doing good work, if you're getting good results, people will be willing to pay what you're charging as long as it's fair. Obviously, you're going to be able to give them their life back, and that's one of the things my flash releases um, been able to do for a lot of people. And then um, I remember back in the day. I mean. Physical therapists and mas uh, massage therapists didn't get along as good. Um, has that changed, have you, would you say, over the years? Or is there still that kind of divided line, What who should do what? Well, I don't know, Ryan. Um, you know, I, 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 probably, I, I probably practice more like a massage therapist, or at least more in a massage therapist world than, uh, than uh, as a physical therapist. You know, walk into my office and you think you walk into a massage therapist's office. It's me and my uh, treatment table. That's it. Um, is there a divide? Yeah, there probably still is. But you know what? There's that same divide between uh, chiropractors and physical therapists. Uh, you know, and will that ever change? You know, sometimes the 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 bridges are crossed a bit. Um, it's it's all silliness to me because we can all have great impact. Physical therapists are feeling, I think they feel a lot of threat uh, from athletic trainers, massage therapists, chiropractors. Um, my professional organization sees that as turf infringement, right? We need to stand up for our uh, our little bit of this turf, and we don't want other people taking it. But you know what? I think if you're doing good work, then there's a, there's always work. There's always turf for you. There's always clients for you. And I know this one hospital where the massage therapists are not allowed to even stretch the client just because it's getting in the physical therapy world and stuff. And, right. You know. right. Well, in, in, you know, in hospitals and in clinics, the same type of turf or uh, you know, delineation of what a person can and can't do have always existed between PTs and OTs, right? You know, PTs, you know, we handle uh, 
from the waist down, you know, gate, that sort of thing. OTs, well, you get the you get the arms, you get the hands, but well, PT, we're going to take the next two because um, it's a little bit more exciting. So, you know, OTs, you guys take that. But, um, you know, I'm being a little bit facetious, but in a lot of settings, that's really how it works. Um, but, I, you know, I know some uh, massage therapists who are just tremendous whole body therapists, whether it's, you know, stretching, whether it's whatever. And I think so much depends on your licensure. Licensure laws vary from state to state, so I would never say that, you know, all massage therapists should or can be doing this. And, you know, when I'm teaching my classes, I ask, are you guys allowed to do, for instance, intraoral work? I do a lot of work inside the mouth. But if, if a therapist taking my seminar is not licensed to do that, I'm not going to encourage them to do that just because they can help somebody get better, right? Um, send them to somebody who can do that work. And do you ever um, get involved in uh, myofascial unwinding at all then? You know, at times, yes. Um, my training was um, was big in myofascial unwinding, and um, I certainly took my uh, took the seminars in myofascial unwinding. It was a big part of the myofascial release experience as a therapist taking the trainings. One of the frustrating parts is always when you go back to the clinic, you know, your patients, boy, I, they never seem to unwind like the other therapists did in class. And, you know, I, I, I kind of was hard on myself. I thought that was more about me that, that um, maybe I wasn't doing it right. But then I kind of realized that there's certain, I don't know, there's sort of seminar performance model that happens in a lot of the, the unwinding classes where, you know, it's that sort of badge of honor is unwinding. Um, unwinding, for those of you that don't know it, is basically sort of an effortless, effortless flow of motion that is termed a lot of different things by a lot of different people. And what's called unwinding mouth fresh release, somatic emotional release in uh, craniosacral therapy. Um, there's so many different somatic based, movement based therapies that have their own version of it. Um, I think a lot of mouth fresh release therapists think that, that, you know, they're the first ones that came up with it. And yeah, that's pretty far from the truth. They might have um, uh, really capitalized on it, done some great training and work with it, but it's it's in a lot of different type of modalities. Um, you know, there, there's some lines that get crossed, in my opinion, in terms of the emotional piece of it, um, where I have a very strong boundary in terms of knowing my practice limits, my my practice law as a physical therapist, in terms of, of venturing into emotions. I do not feel like... Um, I'm trained nor licensed to be um, dealing with somebody's emotions. Now, if somebody has an emotional response during a, a session, I'm certainly not going to stop it or shut them down. You know, I'm going to give them permission, if you will, to feel that. Right? But I'm not going to try and force it. I'm not going to do anything in terms of techniques to try and elicit it. To me, that's, that's borderline um, malpractice. I believe that. But um, I know I'm in a minority there, but I'm willing to go out and live and say that. I believe that. You know, um, emotions should be dealt with by the people who are best trained. Yeah, I think that's the psychotherapist. And do you get into indirect myofascial release too? or um, <clears throat> Define indirect myofascial release. Like strain, counter strain, those modalities? and. Mm, well, um, by definition, and this is where the, the confusion comes, right? There are, if you, if, for instance, if you go to Wikipedia and see, look up myofascial release, direct myofascial release is more considered, um, at least by them, in the way I was trained and taught, um, the deeper, aggressive, um, deep tissue massage type of work, um, I mean, short duration, really deep work, whereas indirect was the very light touch where you're working less at a direct level, more indirectly. Um, I don't know strain counter strain, so I can't even comment on that. Um, but I do know that the type of work I do is more the indirect model. And then another question. Do you feel like uh, New York massage therapists have an advantage because the large amount of hours required for initial licensure um, allows for more specialization right out of the gate? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, well, it certainly gives, it gives that therapist the chance to be exposed to a wider range of Modalities, right? If, you, if you're in, I, I think some of the lesser number of hours are in the 500 range. Is that right? About right there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot less you can cover there than if you're in a 9 to 1200 hour. Or in New York State, the community college model is not uncommon where massage therapy is, a, is an associate's degree. And they're getting a whole lot of clinic hours. They're getting a whole lot of um, 
of class hours, not just in the size modality <coughs> training, but um, a lot more of the science behind it. So, yeah, I would say that it's an advantage. It's certainly an advantage, I think, that I have coming into this because, you know, as a physical therapist with a, with a degree, you, you do a fair amount of background. Now, you know, that being said, I've met massage therapists with 500 hours under the belt of training who've been out in the field for a while who are a whole lot better than a lot of physical therapists I know who, you know, frankly graduated from DPT programs. Um, it, I, it's less about the education, although the education is important, but it's what you do with the education, what you do with your hands, what you do with your mind. And why do you think a lot of schools don't teach myofascial release in their core curriculum? Well, um, I, I'm sure if you talk to a lot of them, I'm sure a lot of it is time, right? If you've got 500 hours, you've got to squeeze a lot in there. Um, again, I'm not a massage therapist, I'm a physical therapist, so I can't talk to a lot of these things um, with a lot of knowledge, but I know your boards are based on probably some pretty um, standard type of modalities, and myofascial release probably isn't one of them, so it doesn't get a lot of importance. I, um, I had an opportunity to give a lecture, uh, usually once a year, for the class at one of the local massage um, schools here in Rochester, and you know, therapists or <clears throat> student therapists really eat it up. It's just it's it's more food that they, they that they get. And, you know, it's, um, everybody's excited about learning more work, but the massage schools get only put so much in. That's probably one of the reasons. Um, if I could turn the tables a little bit, why does the mouth pressure at least get taught more in physical therapy programs? Um, it's because of lack of a lot of evidence-based um, research, evidence-based proof behind it. Physical therapy, for better or for worse, has moved into an evidence-based model where just about everything you're supposed to be doing as a physical therapist should be proven by the evidence, proven by the research. And um, you know, sometimes it's tough when we really step back and take a look at what are we doing is there really proof, you know, an irrefutable proof that what I'm doing has effect and has been proved, and then, you know, a lot of things don't pass that test. <clears throat> and traditionally, myofascial release is one of those things that, that doesn't even come close to passing the test. So most programs across the country don't include myofascial release. I, um, I graduated from physical therapy school back in the mid-'80s, and, you know, myofascial release was around back then, certainly. And we did have one lecture, a two-hour lecture on myofascial release, it obviously was sort of a taboo subject at the uh, University of Buffalo where I went because I can distinctly remember my instructor closing the door, pulling the blind down on the door, and spending those two hours allowing us basically to get the feel, to help it, to engage what we call, what she called the barrier, right? And, you know, I'm still using some of the things that, that uh, Paula taught me back then. Paula, hi, if you're listening, right? Um, because it really, it, it really gave me my first opportunity. But I could tell that it wasn't a popular thing at uh, what was supposed to be taught at the University of Buffalo. But I, it was really appreciated that she gave me that exposure. Yeah, and Les, Leslie in the chat says she hated myofascial release during school. It took me until almost my last six weeks of school to have a decent understanding of it. But now she uses an 80% of her treatments. Right, right. And, you know, let, let's face it, we learn a lot of stuff in school that. Um, it's not very exciting, it's not very well presented, but we got to learn, right? We're tested on it, we might have to take our boards on it. So we do what we need to do. And do you think um, MFR is a little bit easier on the therapist's body, too? Uh, oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's one of the things. It's interesting because a lot of forum sites that belong to um, LinkedIn and Facebook, I get people writing in all the time saying, you know, you know I can't do myofascial release, it's too hard on my body. And say, well, you know, maybe you're doing the wrong kind of myofascial release. If I'm spending the day with my elbow buried in somebody's QL, um, I fatigue really quickly. Um, the way I was taught a lot of the mouthwash release is to combine the lighter indirect work with some of the deep, deeper aggressive work, the soft tissue involved. And I step back even from that. Um, I don't work deep much at all. If I do go deeper, it's with um, a lot less pressure than most therapists, physical massage therapists, are used to using. I'm coining the term um, myomobilization. It's just a way that I describe how I transitioned from doing that aggressive deep tissue work, right? Digging into some psoas with a much lighter version of that that is completely tolerable for somebody. It's not only tolerable for the client, the patient, but, but for me, you know? Um, I gotta last all day. I gotta last for the rest of my career. And I'm pretty certain that if the, the lighter levels that I practice at, I'll be able to do that. And then, um, have you ever been to, you, um, you've never been to the FOSH uh, convention, right? No, unfortunately, I've not, um, I've not had the opportunity. Um, 
had I looked ahead when I was scheduling this year when they had it up in Vancouver, I wouldn't have set up a seminar I had scheduled for that exact weekend. I'm hoping to attend the one in two years. It's going to be, I believe, down in Orlando. <clears throat> and what kind of things go on there? Have you heard? Oh, I think there's some um, you know, presentation of a lot of that cutting-edge research on fashion that, that's really been blossoming over the past six, seven years. Um, I think it's probably a pretty exciting place for a lot of therapists. I really would have been um, appreciated being able to go there and meet some of the people who I've looked up to for a lot of years who um, I've um, made acquaintances with online and, um, and just get a chance to meet them. And from what I understand, there's also some pretty decent trainings and talks by some other experts in the field. Um, just a, a chance for a bunch of fashion nerds to get together. You can understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and how do you think um, Bosch has changed over the years about people's perception of it? <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, it's a tough one. Are, are we talking about the public or therapists? Uh, I'd say therapists. Yeah, therapists. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I, I think it's hard to open uh, any kind of uh, you know, therapy magazine or, or go on the internet without probably getting inundated with uh, with fashion, whether it's people talking about doing fashion work or therapists uh, selling you fashion work, right, whether it's DVD or seminars, you know, um, it's pretty tough enough to, to be aware of it. And I, I know, um, again, I hear some of the negative stuff that the, um, the, the glorification of fashion, the, the Giving the uh, attributing magical properties of fashion, which has become really the rage, really has turned a lot of people off. Not just the people who are seeing the body from that, like I said earlier, in the, in the hour, from that neuro neurology, from that that nervous system way, but um, people are just they kind of pull up to hear when saying fashion's king, right? You know, there's a lot of other people doing other modalities that are getting fantastic results. I step back from uh, from believing that fashion, and now fashion release is the you know, the most amazing uh, um, modality ever invented. To saying, you know what, it's pretty darn good, but there's a lot of pretty darn good modalities out there. Yep. And then you kind of asked um, answered this before, but um, how do you get the same results using light pressure compared to digging in there? Um, it's based on experience. I, I found that um, in the vast majority of cases, you just don't need to do it. And it runs counter to what people believe that if you've got something deep in the body or ropey or tight or scrappy feeling that you have to get in there and beat the heck out of it because that's what we were trained to do, right? I mean, that's how we are trained the model that this is how it feels, this is what we have to do it, and this is how we get results. I am not disputing the fact that you may get results that way. I got results that way in the past too, but over the years of just attempting to lighten my pressure, step back a little bit, Take a little different look at things, and just engage in a, a, a lighter, you know, lighter way. I've seen that you know what, I get the same results. Sometimes better results by using light pressures. And what do your workshops entail then? Um, well, right now I have uh, three different workshops. Um, I'm only actively teaching two of them. Um, you know, I, I just wrote some copy for an article that's going out, and. Uh, I realized that, you know, okay, I came from a model where therapists were expected if they wanted to be an expert to, to take, a, you know, at least a dozen seminars. Um, pretty expensive, pretty time consuming. Um, certainly I learned a lot, right? But the more and more that I teach my seminars, and the vast majority of seminars I'm teaching are my foundations one seminar. It's a 20 contact hour seminar spread over two and a half days. If I'm good at what I do, teaching you the massage service, not a harsh release, the feel, what we're doing, you should be able to leave that seminar and get some pretty incredible results. Now, um, deepening your knowledge base through some more training can be helpful, but to me the most important thing that's going to broaden your knowledge base is practice and reading and understanding what's happening, right? Um, I do give a set of Foundations 2 class. We certainly go into some different techniques. We talk about some different concepts. Techniques are easy. You can, you can pick up a book, you can pick up the, or look on the internet, you can see what your neighbor's doing, right? Someone else is doing. Techniques are the easy part. It's getting the feel, it's getting an understanding of what we're supposed to be accomplishing in the here. I mean, I literally make up new techniques every week. That's the easy part. Getting the feel for this work and what really to me is the core of this work, okay? Um, and that's what my seminars are about. I, I, I really do pride myself in, in giving small group trainings. Now, some people um, really love that large group um, setting. 
Some therapists do. Certainly teachers do, right? It's more money, right? I get it. Um, I love small group trainings because I'm able to physically, personally engage each therapist multiple, multiple times during those two and a half days to give that one-on-one -on -one attention. And I tell you what, that makes me, that, that's what gets me up in the morning. I really enjoy being able to connect with people on that one-on-one -on -one basis. And do you believe a uh, myofascial release can be taught online? <laughs> um, no. No, no. And... <laughs> but, um, no, I, I'll let me elaborate. Um, <clears throat> from a starting point, if somebody who has absolutely no um, experience with myofascial release, I don't want to say it's impossible. I think it's really hard. Um, I know I couldn't do it. I'm not that kind of learner. I know a lot of people who aren't that kind of learner, but I'm not saying that you're not out there because I know there's some pretty good programs out there that people are, have made and are selling, and I don't want to shortchange anybody out there. But um, at least I can only speak from my perspective, the way I teach my seminars. Having that ability to work with somebody, to give the give and take back and forth of me treating them, them treating me at times, right? Sharing what that feels like. I mean, pretty tough to, to teach that either online or on DVD. And do you usually teach more physical therapists, occupational therapists, massage therapists? Um, <clears throat> it's primarily massage therapists and physical therapists. A lot depends on the setting. For instance, I, I, I have an ongoing series in Ohio that I teach at a, um, a state college where um, because of who they advertise to, we get a lot of physical therapists that have to be a lot of massage therapists and occupational therapists too. Um, I'm teaching a class in Rochester this weekend where, you know, seven-eighths of the, of the therapists are massage therapists. You know, why is that? Um, I'm not quite sure. I think massage therapists are a lot more open to mild release. Um, New York State, you know, they just started continuing education hour requirements, so um, MTs have to take CEU hours. And, you know, maybe that's why they're taking my class. I don't think that's the sole reason why they're taking it. But, um, uh, you know, I, there's, I think there's a lot of other reasons why it might be more popular um, MTs and PTs. I know a lot of it is the baggage that was brought up or brought along from the past with all those negative um, connotations that my past release had with physical therapists being, you know, kind of voodoo, right? What I'm trying to do is, is cross that bridge with not just, you know, other therapists, physical therapists especially, that my past release doesn't have to be that voodoo therapy, that it can have a, a decent science backing to it. And, uh, you know, starting to draw some physical therapists, occupational therapists to the class because of that. And is there any certain um, counterindications with myofascial? Counterindications are pretty much the, the norm for any type of manual therapy, be it massage or, or physical therapy. Um, I certainly am not going to list them here, but, you know, um, we're all taught counterindications for, for, let's just call it body work. In school, hopefully, if not, there's some wonderful online resources for general contraindications. You know, those tend to, tend to be movable lines for a lot of people. What was once considered an absolute contraindication isn't, right? Cancer. We're supposed to do hands-on work with cancer patients. Now, you know, some of the research has shown that it's not only okay, but it can be actually beneficial. So uh, we talk about contraindications in my class. We, uh, you know, I, I certainly encourage everybody to be aware of it. And what kind of problems do you have the best um, results with? Um, anything from head to toe. <laughs> uh, you know, certainly, um, there's a slightly higher percentage of my caseload that may be neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, fat or plantar fasciitis, that sort of thing. But what I love about going to work every day is I never know what's going to walk in the room. You know, going to walk in my door for the first time. I think if I was seeing low backs all day, every day, I'd get bored pretty quickly, okay? Um, I had some, some really interesting pain scenarios, um, chronic pain, acute pain, um, but I also get dysfunction-type related things. I get people with swallowing and speech disorders, um, you know, carpal tunnel, um, pelvic floor issues, do a lot of men's and women's health issues. I just, I, I love my job because I can impact somebody's quality of life, and that's not just pain that interferes with somebody's quality of life. So um, I try not to just uh, draw a line of pain as the reason people come in to see me. And as therapists taking seminars, taking inner education, I think those are the type of things you can look at too. Yeah, this is really good for pain, but you're going to have this huge open focus of people you're going to be able to help. 
And what about, um, do you have the clients usually undressed then, or do you just have <laughs> minimal clothing then? or Minimal clothing. Um, I make my clients fully aware um, from the day that we schedule the first session, right? Whether it's um, we have it on the phone or they download the paperwork from my website, is here's what I expect of you, okay? We go through all the expectations. That way there's no surprises, right? Um, I expect you to come in no, or with no emotion or oil. I expect you to come in broad, right? I ask that you bring a certain change of clothing, right? Um, uh, shirts. Everybody brings the shirts, right? I may ask a woman to wear or to bring along a tank top, bathing suit top, or sports bra. If they're not comfortable with that, a, a very loose fitting t shirt is fine as long as they don't mind it getting stretched out. Um, you know, there's some people who just refuse or, um, you know, coincident or conveniently forget those things. I keep a drawer of clothing in my office just in case, right? Tank tops, shorts, so that we can always get out what we need to get out. Monofascial release um, is typically taught as it's got to be done on skin, and I treat 99% of the time on skin. There are times, um, whether it's by my choice or their choice, where I can work over clothing. Sometimes your effectiveness is, is diminished, sometimes you can work okay, but um, my clients are never forced to this robe through the long way that they're not comfortable with. They're always comfortable um, in the room with me. Um, we don't use top, top sheets for the most part, so uh, um, I keep my room warm. And if you had to, um, to do it all over again, would you become what you are today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've always said if, if I couldn't be a chef, then yeah, I'd be doing what I'm doing now. And um, I said that for a long time, and I watched a lot of like, reality TV with uh, chef shows and all, and I don't know whether I really would want to be a chef, but I really like being a physical therapist, and I, I really like doing mouth wash release and teaching mouth wash release. And for people with less hair, is it easy to perform myofascial on the head then? <laughs> <laughs> for people with less hair, it's easier to perform myofascial on the head then. <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, I think, I, I think that, yeah, I never felt it was difficult or, or easy because I had no hair, you know. Um, interesting, because there, there's a technique that at times you have to do, and you have to get in there with a hair pull, right? We're trying to free up some of the the soft tissue, the nerves, the fascia, et cetera, whatever you want to turn it right. I'm not going to get into that now. And just take hold of the hair with a very gentle, sustained pull. It's pretty tough to do that on me. <laughs> and um, do you see um, myofascial release getting, I mean, for more massage therapists in the future then? I mean, do you see that real kind of the core? Do you think that you, you yeah? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I you know, but certainly not is, is, is uh, the only thing they're going to be doing or coming out of school with, right? As I said before, myofascial release is a great modality, but there's a lot of great modalities. I know personally a lot of fantastic teachers out there who teach myofascial release, who teach other things. They're getting tremendous results. Their students, the therapists, are getting tremendous results. You know, um, I try to keep the ego small, okay? Um, myofascial release is a great modality. But so is what you're doing now. You know, this is just something to add. Maybe you want to do nothing with this, like I do. Maybe you just want to integrate this with what you do. But um, you know, give it a shot. Try a seminar. See what you think. And where can people see you in person in the next, um, let's say, three to six months? Oh, okay. Um, well, the best thing to do. Oh, good, good plug there. Good plug. Okay. <laughs> Go to my website, in mfr.com. Go to the drop-down menu. You'll see uh, um, a menu bar that says upcoming seminars. Um, next uh, three to six months, so let, let's do this off the top of my head. Um, San Diego, Georgia, um, Tucson, Kenton, Ohio, um, uh, uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico, um, Philadelphia, Las Vegas. We're doing the, uh, the World Massage Festival next year in Long Beach, California. That should be a lot of fun. We should have a really good crowd there. Um, Charlotte, North Carolina. We've got a lot of seminars scheduled and quite a few coming out. Um, you can always, okay, shameless plug time. You can always log on to my website. <laughs> click, uh, click the uh, join my newsletter. I send out a monthly newsletter for therapists around the world, really, and I include treatment tips on there. I include um, the newest research. I include uh, reprintable um, self-help type things for your patients. And, of course, I'm always plugging myself. There's, it tells you where I'm going to be, where I'm going to be teaching, and where you can come, and hopefully get a chance to learn some of this. And then a final comment. Um, uh, Leslie says, what will stretch your brain? <laughs> do I know Leslie? <laughs> you, you do now. 
apparently I do, yeah. Uh, <laughs> never physically touch the brain, but you know, you can always, you can always get into the ears, right? Yep. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Walt. It's been a pleasure. Brian, thanks for having me. Congratulations on your 100th show here. Thanks, thanks. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in.